Welcome to Data Skeptic Time Series. This is Data Skeptic Time Series, the podcast about how to predict the future based on historical sequential data. Episode number. For reasons that aren't terribly important, I've been thinking quite a bit about clustering lately. Now, typically, clustering isn't something that one thinks about in the context of time series. That is, unless you're today's guest, Mani Tadian, one of the authors of the recent paper, A Clustering Approach to Time Series Forecasting Using Neural Networks. Mani had a lot of insightful things to say about topics we haven't covered so much in time series so far, like hidden Markov models, this clustering stuff, and, of course, dynamic time warping as well. You'll get coverage of all of that and more in today's interview. My name is Amani Tadayon. I got my PhD from University of California in Los Angeles in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Tell me a little bit about your thesis. So what was your major area of study? During the first part of a PhD, I was working on machine learning and educational system, but mainly my work was on probabilistic graphical model and the application of the time series to educational actually system. So the first half of the PhD was on developing a hidden markup model, which is a type of a dynamic Bayesian network work on the sequence data or on time series data and the application on the predicting a student exam. So using the hidden markup model as opposed to a post exam or as opposed to a final exam, Exam. And the long term plan was to see whether it's possible to replace a sequence of maybe educational video games or some sort of intervention as opposed to an exam that is done only during one day, right? So a student can have a bad day, a good day during exam. So it's not really reliable to uh, evaluate a student knowledge using exam. Now, this is for the first half of the PhD. The second half of the PhD, I moved to the causal inference. And again, as most of the work that I have done in my PhD, everything is done through the sequence data or time series data. So the goal was that to use the causal inference and combine it with the hidden marker model that I have done in the past to develop more intelligent or a smarter educational system. We propose to use or to take into the consideration all the confounders, all the things that can go wrong in a student's life, model them and be able able to account for any external problem that usually happen, like a family problem, emotional problem, a stress problem, prerequisite problem that the students have, and then be able to actually develop more intelligent system. Now, this causal inference approach will lead to the final dissertation or thesis that I have, which the title of my dissertation was Causal Inference for Personalized Educational System. Very cool. Well, I definitely want to dig in, but maybe let's jump right to the conclusion and the punchline. Um, did you find any interventions or any techniques that were especially impactful at improving educational outcomes? We realized that if we can actually perform the intervention in a timely manner, we can actually prevent students from failing the course. Now, the intervention that we find to be very useful is talking to the TA talking to the counselor, right? And solving the problem. We usually start with solving the problem. And then we realize that sometimes the students cannot figure out what is the right approach on their own. So they have to talk to the human being. The prior system actually, they don't use causal inference. The prior techniques is usually the intelligent tutoring system that the machine is asking a student what is wrong, how can I actually help a student. Machine doesn't have the same advantage as the actual human being. So the intervention like talking to the TA or talking to the expert like an instructor and talking to the counselor are the most useful intervention in education. Could you describe a little bit about the inner workings of a hidden Markov model? I think people may have some familiarity with it, but what does the quick chalkboard sketch look like and, and how do you decide when it's appropriate for a problem? A hidden Markov model is a very powerful technique that first was introduced in 1989 by Rabiner in his actually seminar paper. So the hidden Markov model is very much related to the Markov chain, whether discrete or continuous time Markov chain. So the idea of a hidden Markov model is that you have a doubly robust 
a stochastic uh, process system. So one stochastic process is the, for the observation and one is actually for the hidden states. So why is called hidden? Because hidden Markov model, because the states actually is hidden, right? The observation is what we observe. They are observable, but the states are hidden. Why do we call Markov? Because the states actually follow the Markov assumption. What does the Markov assumption mean? What Markov assumption mean is that conditioning on them present state the future and past are independent so let's take an example here let's say i want to forecast the weather if the weather follows the markov assumption if i want to forecast the weather for tomorrow all i need to know the weather for today i don't need to know the weather for the all the past histories so that's what we call the markov assumption is actually very much simplification but it works great in the real world data Mahida markov model actually has been used a lot in them for the speech is you has been used a lot in forecasting weather and also to model the stock market so it usually works or always works on a sequence of data or time series data and the reason why it's very powerful is i would say two fourths one hidden markup model can handle supervised and unsupervised time series data so if you have a supervised data means that you have a label for your time series you have many options you can use neural network deep learning if you have lots of data you can use conditional random field so just telling you that the conditional random field is very similar to hidden markup model but is a discriminative version of hidden markup model usually have a higher accuracy higher precision than hmm but it's a supervised learning model hidden markup model can work also on supervised learning model which most of the time in my phd i was dealing with unsupervised it's very hard to label the time series data therefore hmm uses a technique called expectation maximization or in terms of hmm is usually called bomb welch to learn the parameters of the model like uh, observation matrix transition matrix and the prior probabilities which makes it very attractive that's one reason the second reason is that there are lots of package to handle hmm i actually have implemented a package for the hmm in matlab r and python which will be released very soon and i will tell you the name of the package in matlab there is a hmm learn package which is a native matlab package but there is a better package for kevin murphy and that one actually requires the external installation in python there is a hmm learn package and in r there are so many packages but the best one is depth mix which means dependent mixture model depth mix model in r which makes it actually very very attractive in real world well, I know many practitioners today are a little bit spoiled by some of the tooling that's available. I mean, all those libraries sound pretty easy to install, but I even mean a step further that like when you do machine learning, you kind of say, give me some tabular data and tell me your output column and all the magic just happens. Do people who want to pick up a hidden Markov model have the same luxuries or is there a little bit more fine tuning that it takes an expert to know how to use the tool? So the reason why the hidden Markov model requires some expertise and is not really uh, the packages, at least in MATLAB, Python or R, are not really that easy to use. If you look at in the internet, if you just Google hidden Markov model in Python, there are lots of examples, but they are not really that usable. And that's why I started to write that package. One, in HMM, in hidden Markov model, we need to know optimal number of states. This is usually calculated using some sort of Bayesian information criterion, BIC, or Akaiki information criterion, AIC, or cross-validation. So then you should do it by yourself. The, the HMM learn package in Python doesn't do that. The second thing is that if you are decided to use discrete HMM, meaning that the observation are, is discrete, because I have to mention that the states in HMM is always discrete. Now, if you decide to use a discrete hidden Markov model, means the observation are discrete, you have to figure out how you want to discretize the observation. Do you want to use k-mean? Do you want to use expert knowledge? What is the optimal number of levels that you want to use? Maybe you have to take it into the consideration for your cross-validation model. If the observation is continuous, do you want to use a mixture of Gaussian? Okay, great. How many mixture you want to have? You have to take it into consideration for your cross-validation or your BIC and or AIC model. Now, another very, very important thing that usually people ignore is that hidden Markov model uses uh, expectation maximization. What this means is that it usually converges to the lo local optimum as opposed to the global optimum. Therefore, you have to start from multiple initial conditions and you have to take it into consideration for your cross-validation or BIC or AIC model. Therefore, none of the MATLAB or, or Python package actually do this stuff for you. You have to do it by yourself. The package that I wrote, all these stuff are done in Python, which is called a pre-processing and it's done usually through the 
AI, CBIC, and online class validation. Well, I know in addition to some of the techniques we've been discussing, you've also done a lot of work and research of neural networks applied to time series. Was that uh, simply out of an effort to grow the broad spectrum of uh, your experience, or was there something lacking about hidden Markov models and these sorts of techniques that demanded you explore neural networks? The thing, the question uh, that we have is that how can we use deep learning or neural network to forecast the future value of the time series? Now, depends. The question, it can be more challenging. Do I have a univariate time series? Do I have a multivariate time series? In a time series data I have, do I have multiple columns or do I have a single column only? Now, hidden Markov model can handle multivariate time series as well, can handle continuous or discrete. But the question is that why do we use hidden Markov model? We usually use hidden Markov model either for the classification or for the state labeling, we call that usually through, through the Viterbi decoder or the classification through the likelihood actually estimation or likelihood comparison. In terms of forecasting, hidden Markov model usually is not as strong as a long short-term memory, LSTM, or the variation of the recurrent neural network like any more complicated version of the LSTM like CNN LSTM, or even might not be even as strong as the fully connected network if it's done actually designed correctly. Now, there are techniques that you usually consider before you jump to the neural network and deep learning. Before, after hidden markup model for forecasting, I usually consider ARIMA, Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average. ARIMA is a technique that has been used a lot in the literature and is a very old technique, very, very powerful technique. What are the problems with ARIMA? The first problem is that ARIMA is a univariate forecasting technique. So if you have a multivariate uh, time series, you cannot use ARIMA. That's the first problem. The second problem is that ARIMA can handle linear time series. If you have a linear trend, if you have a nonlinear time series, ARIMA is not really that effective. So this actually makes ARIMA also really not that useful for many real world applications. The next thing that we consider was the deep learning and the neural network, if you have lots of data. Now, the obvious choice is people to use a fully connected network is the simplest one, but fully connected network cannot remember long-term dependencies in a time series. And this is actually shown in many different papers. So therefore, the next best tool is the long short-term memory or LSCM. Now, what makes also hidden markup model not really usable for certain application is that in HMM, you usually consider to have a hidden state. Sometimes you want to forecast the price of oil. You want to forecast something that's going to happen in the future. You might not really have any hidden state. And this makes the hidden Markov model to be like an overkill actually for this problem. So that's why we actually start to use a long short term memory. Well, one of the first ways your work crossed my attention was when I found the paper, A Clustering Approach to Time Series Forecasting Using Neural Networks. I hadn't really considered the overlap of clustering and time series in this way, so maybe we could start there. What exactly does clustering offer us in a time series problem? In a cross-sectional study means one point in time. When uh, clustering is done, we actually group similar items together. And the goal that we have in our mind is that these items actually are more similar. Therefore, they can reduce the training time and they can actually enhance the accuracy of our model. Now, this uh, cross-sectional clustering approach can be uh, k-mean, can be k-medoid, can be hierarchical clustering. But for time series, we cannot really use k-mean because k-means is actually a technique for clustering for cross-sectional study because it assumes the observations are independent and there is really no correlation between uh, the features or there is really no autocorrelation between the features. How can we use the clustering for time series? First of all, k-mean has a notion of the mean. There is no notion of the mean for time series. And maybe Euclidean distance is not the right approach that k-mean uses Euclidean distance actually. So first we have to see how we can do the clustering for time series. Now, the clustering technique that we use in that paper, they were divided to two categories, two major categories, feature-based clustering and distance-based clustering. What is really known to the general public is a distance-based clustering, and namely dynamic time warping. So what DTW or dynamic time warping is, is that it try to find the optimal match between two time series, right? And it uses a dynamic time warping distance between two time series, meaning that the time series do not have to have the same length. In Euclidean distance, the time series must have the same length. So these are the advantage of the dynamic time warping. But the dynamic time warping, although 
it has been proved to be very successful in the literature, but it has a polynomial or n square computational complexity, where what is n, n is the length of each time series. Or if the, if the length of one time series is n and the length of the other one is m, the complexity of the dynamic time warping is going to be O m times n. But what about the feature-based clustering? Why are they really attractive? They are really attractive is because you're gonna extract the feature of the time series and then you treat the time series clustering like a normal cross-sectional studies. In a k-means, what we have is that we have usually observations in the rows and the columns are the features that we, are, we care about. In the time series clustering using feature-based methods that I'm going to talk about right now, we actually do pretty much the same thing. We extract the features of time series. We discuss two different techniques here in this paper. We call them method A and method B. Method A, you will uh, extract the time series feature of the time series or time series related feature of the time series. What I mean by this is that you extract the entropy, you extract the autocorrelation, partial autocorrelation, Holt parameter, stability of the time series. For that, you can either do it yourself or there is a very wonderful package written by Rob Hindman, which is a very famous person in time series domain and the package is called TS features. It's available in R. Just letting you know that the package only handles univariate time series. So you have to extend it to the multivariate time series yourself. That's one thing. We call this one method A. Method B is when you use the, when you consider a time series to be like a signal and you extract the signal features of a time series. What do I mean by that? I mean something like energy of a signal, wavelet transform, hue transform, Fourier transform. So you extract these features. And now which one? extract more features, the method B or the signal based time series clustering, they extract more features. It takes longer time and they prove both to be the same actually. And they are both really fast. And in the paper, we show that they are actually both really accurate. Now, going back to the question that you ask, is uh, the clustering going to help them forecasting? So in this paper, we show that if you cluster the time series, meaning that you at the end, the goal that you have in your mind is to train the similar sequences together. Not only you're going to reduce the complexity of the training of the time series, but also you're going to increase the accuracy and reduce the RMSC, MAP, and the MAE error. RMSC is root mean score, MAP is mean uh, absolute percentage error, and MAE is mean absolute error of the time series. So overall, we actually prove that the clustering is uh, exceptionally useful for the time series forecasting. So then with a method like that, I'm a little curious about the distribution of cluster labels. Do you end up being able to generate a label for every observation and say, this particular data point in my time series belongs to cluster A or B? Is that how the output comes? There are two types of clustering. We have clustering across time, which we call is sequence labeling. Hidden Markov model is great for that. And we have a clustering across the observation, meaning that let's say that I have a time, two time series. Let's say the first time series is one, two, three, four, five, and the next one is six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So these are two observations. And in the clustering that you do using feature based or distance based like dynamic time warping, you actually cluster across observation. You say the first point is for cluster one and the second, the first observation, one, two, three, four, five is for cluster one and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten is for cluster two. The problem that you were discussing is that I want to actually say that cluster the time series per time point. This is called sequence labeling. And this is when we do actually the decoding of the hidden markup model. We actually use the Viterbi algorithm to actually say that, okay, the first point is cluster one, the second one is cluster two, the third one is cluster three. So we actually tag the sequence of the numbers. And let's talk a little bit about the neural network architecture then. How do you bring this all together into one model? We decide to use a long short-term memory, LSTM, because we have a time series data. The question that should be asked or a couple of questions. One is that how many layers of neural network I should have? How many neurons I should use per layer of neural network? What should be other architecture I should use? Should I use any regularization? Should I use any batch normalization? But more importantly, do I have any static data? So LSTM 
can handle time series data with long-term dependency. This is good. But do I have any static data? And we did have a static data, right? So for some model, we only include the dynamic measurements or the time series measurement. We call it dynamic measurement in the actual paper. But for some other models, we actually take advantage of the static data as well. Therefore, we design seven models in the paper. The first three model is only through the dynamic measurement or time series measurement. And we started by using first by having only one layer. And if this is not sufficient or if the error that we have is not low enough, we actually add more layer or try to optimize the number of neurons per layer and try to play actually with the loss function and try to actually play with the regularization that we have. So for the dynamic measurement, we started with one layer, then we move to two layers, and then we try to do the bidirectional LSCM as well. But then we ask ourselves, we have a static data as well. How can we develop a model or a structure that can we combine the static and dynamic measurements together? So for that is the, that when the modeling gets very exciting. So you have the LSCM model. But then you get the output of LSTM, and now you have to have some sort of a fully connected network. You have a fully connected network after the long short term memory. You combine this with the static features, and then you can actually concatenate them, concatenate the columns, actually. And then you can actually go ahead and design a normal, fully connected or feed forward neural network. And this corresponds to model four, model five, model six, and model seven in the paper. What we showed is that if you use a static data, you can actually help increase the accuracy of the model. So if you use more information, if you have some inform, so in the previous papers, usually people only use the dynamic measurements only the time series data. But we showed that if you have some sort of static data, some data that you think it can help you, but at the same time, you don't really know how to include it into your model. You can use LSCM for the dynamic measurement, and then you can use fully connected network for the static and dynamic measurement. There's big news from my favorite home security company. Simply Safe just launched their new wireless outdoor security camera. That's right, Simply Safe, the system that US News and World Reports named best home security system of 2021 just got even better. This brand new outdoor security camera is engineered with all the advanced tech and security features you want and need to help keep you and your family safe. It has an ultra wide 140 degree field of view so you can keep watch over your entire yard. It has a 1080p HD resolution with an 8x zoom. That means you can zoom in and clearly see things like faces and license plates, in case you need to capture critical evidence. It has a built-in spotlight with color night vision, so you can keep an eye on what's going on day or night. It's super simple to set up and usually just takes minutes. It has an easy to remove rechargeable battery, so it doesn't need an outlet and can go anywhere on your property. This camera has it all and integrates with your Simply Safe home security system, extending its protection to the outside. Together, it means every door, window, and room are protected. And now, your entire property will be too. To learn more about this exciting new Simply Safe wireless outdoor security camera, visit simplysafe.com/slash data skeptic. What's more, Simply Safe is celebrating this new camera by offering 20% off your entire new system and your first month of monitoring service free. That's when you enroll in interactive monitoring. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash data skeptic. The following message comes from Data IQ, the platform for everyday AI. The potential for positive change with AI is huge, but seeing the value is hard. It's about organizational transformation, not just technology. And today's businesses struggle with the complexities of bringing AI initiatives to fruition. That's where Data IQ comes in, bridging the gap between all of the challenges and tensions present to infuse a culture of working with data and AI every day and at every level of the company. Whether solving for the mundane, like automating forecasting, or what is the optimal number of widgets to buy, or undertaking moonshots that push the limits of today's technology to grow your organization and innovate. Join more than 45,000 people meeting worldwide across banking, insurance, pharmaceuticals, manufacturing, retail, and more, who are driving exceptional results with Data IQ. 
Visit dataiku.com to learn more. That seems like an elegant way to do it then. That doesn't require too much on the part of the user knowing how to hyperparameter tune then, I guess. Is that the main reason for the approach? The thing is that for the hyperparameter approaching or actually optimization, there are many techniques to use. The best thing is that you actually plot the error for the training error and the validation error, and then monitor this very closely to see at what point the validation actually loss is trying to increase. Then you say, that, okay, this is the time that I have to actually stop the training of the neural network, and this is the, maybe the ideal hyperparameters that I have. So the, including the static network here will tell us that I'm using more information, maybe the dynamic measurement. So the dynamic measurement or the time series data give us some good accuracy. But I'm asking myself, is there any other information that I can use to increase the accuracy of my model? And usually this was the case if during my PhD, but I never had much data actually to use a neural network. But this is the case also during this work that I have done, meaning that I included data that was not in the form of time series, but we somehow included in the neural network. Well, let's talk a little bit about the results then. Across those seven models, what kind of performance metrics did you look at and how did things stack up? We look at a couple of actually performance metrics in terms of the error. So we use a RMSC, root mean score error, mean absolute percentage error, and MAE, mean absolute error. And another metric we look at also was time. How long does it take to actually train this model, which is actually quite important. So this study was very important to see, okay, which model is doing the best in terms of all four metrics that I mentioned, also in terms of the clustering. We care about the forecasting model, also we care about the clustering. We saw that in terms of the clustering, the feature-based clustering technique outperformed the distance-based clustering in terms of the speed, by far. In terms of the accuracy, the feature-based clustering is not dominating the distance-based clustering, or in a sense, the dynamic time warping most of the time outperformed the feature-based clustering, both method A and method B, at the cost of time. Now, in terms of the forecasting models, it's very interesting to see that sometimes even one layer hidden markup model combined with the clustering technique can actually result in a very, very good performance metric. Very low error and also in terms of the time is very satisfactory time. Even one layer optimized model. For most of the, for a lot of techniques, actually we realize that two layer LSTM is the best model. And bi-directional LSTM also for some of the models outperformed the two-layer actually LSTM. It was only one model that I recall that it, according to what we have, is that only for one of the models that one-layer LSTM actually results in the best accuracy or best performance metric. So the conclusion was that if you are looking for a time to save time, uh, the feature-based clustering is the best. If you are, have a lot of resources and time is not a really important metric, then you can use a distance-based clustering dynamic time warping. If you want to find the overall best performance metric, bidirectional LSTM combined with the dynamic time warping or the feature-based clustering provide the best performance metric. Well, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. You've got good empirical results that's showing there's advantages to these clustering techniques, so there's a motivation to use them. But I'm curious, if you kind of look under the hood, is there anything interpretable about them? Can you understand what wisdom the clusters are latching onto? So in the paper we explain about the idea behind the clustering is that this was also certainly the case during the PhD or during actually any domain that people are interested in. When you plot them, so in the machine learning domain, the, one of the most important area of the uh, designing a model is actually a mod the step before designing a model, is a pre-processing technique. In this paper, before starting the clustering or time series forecasting, we actually perform the anomaly detection and the missing value imputation for the time series data. Usually this step should be done actually for the cross-sectional study and usually this, they account to 90% or 85% of the task. Now, what you see if you plot this time series data or what you see if you actually you look at the statistics of the time series, you see that you have some sort of outliers or you have you see that the data are not really similar together at all. The question that you should ask yourself is when the data 
or not similar? Is it reasonable to train them all together? Is it possible that I train similar data together? Can I increase the accuracy or reduce the error in my model? And this is what clustering is doing. What clustering is doing is that it developed three different groups, let's say for our case. Then you can go ahead and develop one forecasting technique per each cluster. Now, what is attractive about that? What is attractive here is that you don't, you can optimize each model separately. For one model, you can use one layer LSTM. For another model, you can use bidirectional LSTM. For another one, you can use as many layer LSTM as you like. And then you can combine them together. So the math here is based on the law of total probability. You have, let's say, 400 multivariate time series. You say that in 100 observation or 100 time series, it correspond to cluster one, 200 correspond to cluster two, and 100 correspond to cluster three. And then at the end, you're gonna go ahead and combine all these clusters together. The reason why this is better is that you are training similar data points all together, similar in terms of shape or similar in terms of the features, depends on what clustering techniques actually you're using. Dynamic time warping mainly is shape-based clustering, feature-based clustering or feature-based clustering. Then you can actually put them together and it's understandable to reduce the complexity of model. At the same time, it's understandable to improve the accuracy or reduce the error. Do you have any thoughts on, or maybe heuristics or rules of thumb, on when these tools that you're describing, like these clustering techniques, are going to be useful for a time series problem? For example, are there specific industries you think should be exploring this, or is it really a broad-reaching technique? Yeah, so the thing is that the clustering technique, if the task is a forecasting, it's clustering, I would consider it as a pre-processing step. It's as a part of the first, we do the anomaly detection, then we perform the missing value imputation, and then clustering. Now, clustering will not hurt. It will never actually hurt to perform clustering in order to do forecasting is not going to reduce the is not going to reduce the accuracy or increase the error in our model now the problem is that what about the time complexity because you have to consider some time performing what is the right cluster we know that the cluster will reduce the overall time but the question is that how many clusters do i have what is the optimal number of clusters so there are a lot of actually techniques or there are a lot of domain knowledge needed actually for this section of the work now in terms of the industries that are using that any industry that has a lots of or large volume of data any corporations that assume like netflix or amazon amazon actually mainly i assume work with them time series data facebook any corporation that has a large or is working with the data in a large scale can benefit from this technique because they have a large amount of data so this forecasting techniques the lstm can be useful but at the same time this feature-based clustering can be very attractive because they don't need to deal with the computational complexity of the dynamic time warping one side point to that, I guess, uh, I appreciate your framing of it, that there is this computational cost, but from sort of an operational perspective, if I was eager to roll this out, couldn't I build the argument that that cost is incurred once, that there's some, you know, really big spark job or something that does all the calculations, I materialize those to a database, and now we have our clusters moving forward? Absolutely. I agree with that. The thing is that for the clustering, the advantage, another advantage of clustering is that so if you have actually more data points, if you, let's say that you have a, one model for the, all the data. And so the, the clustering, when I was discussing about that, I said one advantage of that is a time. So, okay, so if you have one model that actually you have trained it before, now you are actually doing the testing. So, okay, so you might say that, okay, clustering might not be able to help here. But what clustering can help is the increasing the accuracy. And that's what is shown in the paper. So if the accuracy or lowering the performance, lowering the error, RMSC, MAE, or MAPE is your concern, this paper is a proof of concept that clustering might be needed. Now the question is that how much you care about this error metric. If you don't care much about that or what you get from like training all the sequences all together, you want to train them once and then you're testing later after that and you're happy with your model, maybe you don't really gain much from clustering. But the proof of concept is that the clustering is a pre-processing technique that sometimes when you don't achieve the error metric that you want, you can actually use the clustering. Well, to switch gears a little bit, I'd love it if you can tell me more about what TSBN Gen is, the Python library you've been working on. The idea, the motivation behind that, there are a lot of people 
uh, doing research in industry a lot of people actually are doing research in academia mainly that they don't really have a time series to work with they don't even have a data to work with that was definitely a case in our domain as well most of my research was centered around the educational system the method i developed can be easily used in other domain especially medical domain but most of them centered in education collecting data in education or also in medical is a very very time consuming process so the question is that how can I generate data synthetically that is very similar to the real world data? How can I generate data based on a model? So you have a model designed by educationists, by a medical doctor. How can I design and generate data according to that? There are some techniques done in the past, like they use GAN, recurrent GAN, generative adversarial network, but they use it for time series. But the caveat is that GAN records a lot, lots of data to begin with. We don't really have data at all. So we cannot really use generative adversarial network for the time series for our application. At the same time, GAN is not really that popular for time series data as opposed to the images. So now this actually forced me to think, is it possible to develop model-based technique? The TSB engine, as the name suggests, is a time series Bayesian network generation. What this package does is to generate the synthetic time series data according to any Bayesian network structure that you would like. I talk about the time series. You don't have to. You can generate cross-sectional data. Just go ahead and set the length of time series to one. It will set the cross-sectional data. It will set the, generate data for cross-sectional study for any normal or uh, machine learning technique like, I don't know, decision tree, random forest, uh, gradient boost. You want to work with a hidden Markov model, LSTM, you don't have data, you can actually use the TSP engine. Yeah, how do I, uh, if I have a Bayesian network in mind, that's my underlying model, I need to specify the nodes and their conditional probability tables and all that sort of good stuff. How do I provide my model to you? I received uh, lots of email about the package. I have the documentation in the GitHub. I created actually set of videos in YouTube as well to explain people about that. So yes, as you mentioned, TSP engine, let me just talk about the functionality of that. It can handle discrete Bayesian network meaning that the nodes actually follow multinomial distribution. It can handle continuous uh, Bayesian network, meaning that the node actually follow the uh, Gaussian distribution. It can handle mixture of uh, discrete and Gaussian nodes. Now, it can handle any number of observation across the observation. It can handle any number of time points across time. What should be done is as follows. You provide the adjacency matrix. What adjacency matrix does is that it gives you the structure of the Bayesian network. Then you provide the conditional probability table for the discrete nodes, for the only discrete nodes, and the mean and the variance for the continuous nodes. Then what other things should be provided is a loopback. So the idea behind that is when I first developed the TSB engine, it took me a couple of months, actually one and a half months, I said it took me to develop TSB engine completely working for any structure. However, it was working for the classical dynamic Bayesian network that you see in the literature. The question I have is, can I use the TSB engine for more challenging purposes? Is it possible that I want a node one at time one to be connected to node one at time 10? I don't want node one only at time one connected to node one at time two. This is a classical line of Bayesian network. I want the node one at time one connected to node 20. Is it possible I can handle this? I develop a variable called loopback. So loopback by default is one, but then you can set the loopback to be any value you like. And this is another parameter that you specified in the TSB engine. If you don't specify that, the, the default is one. Now, there is actually another very important parameter that should be specified, and that one is a type of a node. If we're using um, a string, is it a discrete D or is it continuous? So the type of a node, the conditional probability tables, and the loopback, and then this is all actually you want, and the adjacency matrix as well, and this is all you want to generate data. Usually at this point, before I go into any sort of wrap up, I like to double check, is there anything you think we should have covered that we haven't gotten to? 
Uh, one thing is that uh, I want to actually combine all these ideas that I discuss, uh, starting from this uh, TSB engine. So in the paper, the clustering approach to time series forecasting using neural network, a lot of people might say that, okay, so let's say the code will be shared actually again very soon. But the people say that we don't really have much data to work with. The idea that I discuss in this paper for generating synthetic time series data is a little bit different from the TSB engine. And the idea is that you generate the data for each column of the time series using some sort of ARIMA model. You specify auto regression, you specify the moving average, and then you add AWG and noise to that. And then you create some sort of outlier and missing value to exactly mimic the real world data. But now that this TSB engine is available, you can actually generate much richer data or much richer set of time series for your task. For TSP engine, other parameters that are really obvious is that you can specify the length of time series. So here, for example, the length was 100. You can specify the length of each time series to be 1000, anything you like. You can specify how many observation you want. You want 400 or you want to see whether the, your deep learning technique actually is strong or not. You can use 10,000. This is the advantage of the TSP engine. Then you can go ahead and use this clustering approach to time series to see if which clustering technique actually work is the best for your data. Now, combining this with the idea of a hidden markup model. So for this, if you want to use the HMM or hidden markup model and combine it with this idea of a clustering approach to time series forecasting or uh, clustering, the hidden markup model can be used for the clustering technique as well, even the across the observation. It's called probabilistic clustering is not going to perform as good as the feature-based or the distance-based clustering that I discussed, but it's just an idea that can be actually tried. Well, Manny, where can people follow you online? I'm active in Twitter, LinkedIn, I'm active as well. I'm very active in Medium. I write frequent articles for Medium. I upload the, my YouTube channel like recently, I uploaded with the TSP Engine package. I am planning to share the code for hidden markup model for all three languages and in create a video actually in YouTube. So most of the social media platforms I'm fairly active in them. Well, awesome. We'll have links to all that in the show notes so people can follow up. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on today and share your work. Thank you so much for having me. That concludes another installment of Data Skeptic Time Series. Our guest today, Mani Tadayan. Thanks to our sponsors, Data IQ and Simply Safe. Myself, Claudia Armbruster, as associate producer, Vanessa Bly, guest coordinator, and our host, Kyle Polich. <laughs>